I don't want to get like overly wonky about it, but I'm curious what is more interesting to you, the, the reduction of friction around like known things to start a traditional business or whatever versus like exploration around what the next technology is of business, like the next LLC or the next law or, you know, something that yeah. would unlock a lot more. It would, it would be a step change, not just like lots of one and 2% increases. What, what's the next corporation? Yeah. What's the next? That yeah. seems like a ridiculous question, but like. Well, but it, corporation was it, so so totally, but, and it was an invention. Yeah, like it did. Well, it's, it's not a corporation not a natural, not for a law, right? Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's a really good question, and maybe it seems too kind of grandiose or something to uh, to spend you know too much time thinking about that. But I but I think it's I think it's a very good question. We, we I mean we 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 give it I think some amount of thought, and we think that sometimes we might fall into such things. I mean, I, look, I, you're going to say something. Well. well I think we start with removing as much friction as uh, humanly possible. And again, there's just way more of it than you could possibly know. Like, do you know about the Chicago lease tax? No. That <laughs> anyone who leases Tell more, me, please. anyone who leases more than a hundred thousand dollars to uh, Chicago residents has to pay a lease tax. Uh, you know, it's a, a revenue tax. But they define lease quite broadly, including SaaS, basically. So any SaaS company mm. that uh, sells more than $100,000 of SaaS, which is probably like a few million dollars a year kind of total, yep. uh, uh, has to pay the city, has to go implement this city of Chicago lease tax. And again, this is yet another thing that a business has to go do and kind of like the cost of the friction, you know, the ball bearings in the British economy. It's yet another thing that is kind of minuscule by itself. Mm. But when you add together, like, you know, the but, bacteria in your gut actually weigh a lot, you know, uh, yeah. all, all told, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the weight of all this kind of adds up. So I think we start with let's remove all the friction. However, when you actually meaningfully change a lot of that, I think new things become possible. And so we have a lot of multinationals on Stripe that are like, year old five person companies. And again, when you think of multinational, you think of giant skyscraper campuses. And you know, that, that's the image that comes to your head when you hear the word multinational. Whereas we have all these businesses that are now selling globally kind of from day one on Stripe, um, as a result of it being easier to do so. The other one that we think is exciting is kind of marketplace based business models, thanks to the internet. I think there's you know, a few components, but one of the things you need is the liquidity of the internet that you get these Airbnbs and, you know, right. in the case of Uber, you probably need smartphones, not just the internet. Um, uh, so, so you need kind of the tech foundations, but then you also need to make it easy for people to actually transact with each other and do two-way stuff. And, you know, Stripe Connect the, is kind of the marketplace payment product that didn't really exist before that. And so again, I think you get these new kinds of businesses that are much, much easier than before. I think you're saying like at some point a change in degree is a change in kind, which I yes. think is like true, but... I don't know. I, I I really like this this question as well. And actually, if any of your um, if your watchers or listeners have suggestions, you know, we'd be very yeah. exactly very, very interested. Like, I, I think Atlas was kind of this, and that I think it. I mean, we know because they tell us that there are thousands of businesses that have been started in countries where I don't know high tech entrepreneurship has not you know previously been as common or as popular. Um, uh, that wouldn't have been started you know if not for Atlas. But like there's Steve Randy Wallman who who writes you know really interesting. Um, um, materials about economics and, and finance and so on. You know, he, he, he had this blog post, um, it was like in 2013 or something that, that, that really stuck with me about how, you know, credit financing um, is, is sort of, um, is, a, is fixed cost to the borrower mm -hmm. um, or, you know, asymptotically fixed cost uh, within some, some range or something. Um, uh, but you know, has the risk, uh, the, the the sort of uh, the unbounded risk of maybe like destroying your business, right? Yeah. And equity capital has unbounded costs, but does not come with the embedded risk of you know possibly blowing up your business. It's interesting to think about like the possibility of a continuum there, yeah. uh, and to what degree it's kind of necessarily dichotomous. If you think about a small business, yeah. um, it, sure. it, effectively there there are options um, kind of uh, uh, run into that dichotomy, and like, is it? Why is it the case, I mean, if you just take, take a restaurant, like, why is it the case that, well, one, the restaurant probably can only get access to financing that might blow up their business. <laughs> um, and, and certainly maybe they can like convince some investors to you know, write them their first check or something, but like there isn't a whole lot in the middle. And I think one of the, you know, one interesting story from the last, I don't know, 15 years on the internet, on the internet is, um, is the proliferation of you know crowdfunding obviously and you know different variants of that and so forth. So anyway, I think kind of the question of are there interesting new funding models that could be invented um, is is a good one. And it, 
d dominant assurance contracts. Mm -hmm. I thought were always kind of interesting. They never really seem to have taken off, but like it feels like there might be kind of new points in the space. So, so yeah, I think there's stuff in the in the in the domain of like funding models. We we we, we do discuss different versions of this, um, uh, and I think standardization is is often underrated mm -hmm. and like. One of the best things the EU has done is just standardize things that were previously um, for no kind of particularly profound reason. In the yeah, sense of like an heterogeneous call as standardization, like we all just agree, like this is the way we do things. And so everything's kind of interoperable as a result. Yeah, basically. Um, like the, I mean, the US has this obviously with the, the, the uniform commercial code. And I think like the US minus that would be just like a way worse place to do business. Right. Um, but, 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 but again, in a kind of, in a hard to articulate way. Like it sounds very arcane as like, well, you know, the, the product liability requirements and like this stage versus that stage, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, pretty quickly the, the listener is, you know, clicking on the next podcast episode. <laughs> um, and, uh, and uh, you know, the EU has done sort of its, its version of there. So anyway, we, 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 we've thought about, are there things that Stripe could help standardize that are not standardized today? We can yeah. just kind of be a coordination point. I, I mean, obviously this, YC did an awesome version of this with safes, yep. right? Like how much less investing would happen at the early stage absent the existing of, existence of safes? That's great. Um, like, you know, I don't know, but, but it seems plausible to me that it's like 30% or something. Um, yep. uh, like it, it seems credible that it's a significant effect. Um, or maybe if someone else had standardized it, maybe we'd have like standardized in kind of a, in a worse point in the space or something. Yep. Um, so anyway, whatever, we, we don't make the whole podcast episode about this, but I think it's a really interesting question. If you think about the, that, I like the idea of the hundred trillion, what's, you know, where's the next 50 coming from? I'd love to hear what you've learned about business formation and small business versus reducing frictions for existing, you know, medium or large size businesses and letting them get way bigger than they were, they would, but for that outstanding friction. So even that like Chicago example, sounds like a pain in the butt, even for like a real established business. Totally. And that, you know, maybe the faster way is to like make it easier for big companies versus creating the chart we started with of like making more small companies. So what, what have you learned about big versus small and what matters in this goal to, you know, grow the GDP of the internet? No, for sure. And, and that is like, in terms of where Stripe is going, a lot of where we started with was kind of make it easier for a startup to do X, uh, say on kind of the, 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 the lease tax uh, example and just generally kind of the billing system. Yeah. A lot of what the Stripe billing team has been spending time on of late is you now have companies like Atlassian and Cloudflare and all these kind of very large public companies who are kind of moving their billing infrastructure uh, over to uh, over to Stripe billing so that, as you say, they can not just move the payment, like the kind of the moving of money, but all the business logic can live in Stripe so that they don't have to build and maintain it themselves because the maintenance that kind of crushes people. But in terms of the difference between uh, large and small, not that different in some ways. I mean, well, that's been the surprise for me, at least. Um, say more. Well, I, I, there's a set of things that I think are obviously um, much more relevant at the kind of quote unquote high or large end than the low end, right? In that. Um, revenue recognition is just never that important for a tiny business because, you know, the, the process you use to calculate your revenue is just not that complicated uh, in, in almost every case. Whereas it, for it's any, a function of accrual and often audited, you know. A, 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 exactly. So, 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 yeah, revenue recognition, you know, really reliably skews large. But we're continually surprised when we build things that we conceive of as being for the low end, how frequently they get mm -hmm. enthusiastically uh, adopted at the high end. So, you know, for example, payment links is, you know, we, we want to lower the barrier to entry to Stripe. And, you know, for your, if you're just making a couple of sales, why do you need to build a payment form? Why can't you, uh, why can't you just, you know, sign up for Stripe and put in some details about your product and then just like send a URL to, you know, your, your friend or your first customers or whatever. And then like, maybe when you reach your hundredth sale or your thousandth sale, mm -hmm. like, okay, I'll do the work, like build a proper thing here or whatever. <laughs> payment links is pretty enthusiastically adopted by large companies mm -hmm. for basically the same reason. Um, in that, you know, like, it's like the, the, the soil and green uh, principle, you know, everything is made of people. And, there, you know, there are, there are humans inside these large organizations. And those humans, even large organizations, have, you know, opportunity cost attached to their time. And if they can go and, you know, build some incremental new feature that aligns with the core purpose of their business, that's in general probably a more valuable thing to do than go and, like, build this payment form, right? Um, and so, yeah, whenever we've built, 
like no code functionality um, or just generally speaking things that lower barriers to entry where the original persona that we you know have or had in mind was was somebody kind of starting out we keep being struck by um, by we, we had a user at um, at our at our annual excuse me at our, at our weekly um, uh, sort of all hands uh, meeting uh, last week who you know there, there are pretty significant company. I don't know the exact employee count is, but I believe in the hundreds. Uh, and, you know, his ask to us, we asked, how can we improve Stripe? He asked for more no-code functionality because they're strapped for engineering resources and they just want to be able to like take things off the shelf and uh, and sort of snap them to grid. So that's been, that's been eye-opening for me. Hmm. Yeah, there's also a dynamic where like the very largest companies that we work with are often competing with startups and seeing mm. new upstarts come along. And so the buying criteria are no longer as different as you might think, because they know that their customers might just go to, uh, you know, we work with a number of uh, traditional grocery stores and they're all competing with the, you know, the Instacarts and the, um, you know, shipped before they were uh, acquired. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of these kind of small upstarts doing delivery and stuff like that. So it's like, wow, the digital experience really matters. We got to figure out our app strategy. We got to figure out our delivery strategy, things like that. But that dynamic, I think, ends up um, merging the considerations maybe more yeah. than they otherwise would. Mm. If you think about the future of Stripe, you guys are so lucky. You have so, many, so much time to do whatever the answer to my next question is. What do you want it to be that it's not yet? And or what do you want it to be more of, like most specifically in the decades to come? An important thing about Stripe uh, today is that you know, we're always trying to remind people who join because you know, Stripe is, um, is say 12 years post-launch and so you know, they mightn't appreciate this necessarily, that just measured against the goals we set out to solve when we started, there's still not only a lot to do, but in certain ways, you know, we're even further from solving them than we were at the outset, where in the very beginning of Stripe in, say, 2011, accepting online payments or moving money online basically meant facilitating, you know, pretty basic, pretty straightforward credit card transactions. But now, over the last couple of years, there's been this incredible proliferation of payment methods, um, usually run by central banks, but, you know, all the different wallets and, you know, national payment schemes and, and, and so forth that have added. I mean, the good news is they've brought immense numbers, like billions of new people online and enfranchised them to participate in the internet economy. But the flip side is they've made the landscape so much more complicated. And we're now in this kind of funny position where even very sophisticated companies are um, often inadvertently restricting their customer bases to be only a you know, relatively small percentage of what they could be um, uh, if, they, uh, if they're sort of comporting themselves properly. So just assessed against kind of the most basic criteria of like is stripe making it easy uh for for a business to accept revenue from let's say at least 90 percent of internet users uh the 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 um the standard for that has gotten an awful lot higher and while you know stripe is now way more powerful than it ever was in the past uh it's uh, it's interesting that just like the complexities of the world uh are are also you know advancing considerably and that's before you get into all the other stuff that's happening around you know different tax things and regulatory things and data privacy things and just now you need to have you know an android app and an iphone app and, whatever, and just like the, the the complexity of the whole landscape is 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 considerable and, and greater so you know we want stripe to be a um <laughs> a global programmable money movement engine for all of these different use cases and you know possibilities available to businesses everywhere in the world and capable of executing transactions on behalf of people you know anywhere in the world uh, and and as we just think about kind of the the n dimensional matrix of functionality entailed in that we still have a long way to go um, and then the second part of your question was and, and you know what, what or it was, what do you want Stripe to do? And then it was like, what do you want Stripe well, to be? What I'm getting at is like, you know, let's say we're, uh, you're retired, hopefully better than your mom, and you're in your rocking chair. Mm. And, you know, Stripe is described, you want Stripe to be described as X, Y, and Z. You know, it, it, you'll sort of be able to feel like you can rest easy, you've done a good job, because Stripe is blank or has done blank. Like that, that's sort of kind of looking backward. Have you read um, Tim Wu's book, The Master Switch? Yes. Um, I really like that book and there's lots of random, you know, I learned lots about the history of radio that, you know, I didn't know. And so uh, it's always fun in that way. Um, but when you think about it, 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 like, as you reflect on it, you should be kind of scared, uh, because basically the takeaway from the book is, uh, 
every other information network that has been start, started has started out with lots of innovation and kind of a healthy ecosystem. Low barriers to entry. Uh, exactly, low barriers to en entry, and has ended up as a monoculture regulation captured oligopoly with like two or three big players that get to extract rents. And that has happened with every other information network to date. But we'll see if it happens to the internet. Like that's kind of the <laughs> yeah. unsettling note that you know Tim Tim Wu leaves you on. And Stripe can hopefully contribute to you know the internet is different, and the internet is, I think one could argue, a bigger deal than all those other yeah. technologies uh, for lots of reasons. But again, th the warning signs are there, and you see this a lot, where a lot of um, internet commerce stops at national borders, which, you know, should not be like the packets don't travel any slower as they uh, as they cross them. You know, the, the gravity, the gravity equation in trade says that, you know, trade falls off with the square of distance. Uh, and that maybe makes sense if you're shipping, you know, beef, uh, it goes off, it's, you know, complex to, you know, ship across countries, you have to refrigerate it, everything like that. It makes less sense when you're shipping software. And yet the gravity equation still exists in digital trade. And so, Again, I think part of our hope would be there is a real plausible world where we end up with four or five big internet companies that are the internet companies that have a like really out outsized share of the online activity happening there. And it's not that, you know, it's illegal to start a company. It's not that it's impossible to start a company, but the barriers are so high to break through that, like, you know, no one is preventing you from starting a telco, but nobody does because, you know, the barriers and the costs are, are, are so high. That would clearly be a really bad outcome and should make us sad. And so I think if we could feel like we contributed to the next 70 years of vibrancy in the internet economy, which of course is just becoming kind of the global economy generally, mm -hmm. where you're continuing to make it accessible for new entrants to come in and compete on a level, level playing field mm -hmm. with all the existing folks. I'd be pretty happy with that. Mm -hmm.